Oh, right. well, gotcha. very faint. Oh, yeah, you're right. I got to gotta do the announcements. Uh, let me see here. I don't know what I got to announce today. Because uh, there's something wrong with that boy. So, fellowship hour will be tomorrow, y'all willing, at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, What else do we have to announce? You said faint echo now? Is it back to normal? It should be back to normal now, though. Um, yeah, we're good. Uh, DJ got homecoming tomorrow. Fellowship hour is at 4 p.m. It is online, so you can join from wherever you are. We also have um, the Day of Trumpets coming up, right? Day of Trumpets is going to be... Let's see here. Day of Trumpets is going to start the evening of the 14th and take you on through the evening of the 15th of this month. So, you know what I'm saying? Make sure, you know what I'm saying? According to our law, that would be a Sabbath for us. Uh, so, you know what I'm saying? We should not work on that day. Um, then after that, you would have the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is going to be the 24th of September. And it will um, uh, it will take you through. Uh, it will actually starts on the 23rd of September to take you through the 24th of uh, September. On that day, not only do we not work, but we also do not eat. Um, that is a day of affliction, of fasting for us. Um, and then lastly, what do we have? We had a week of in gathering that's coming after that, but we'll talk about that next time. Um, I think that's it for announcements. So fellowship hour, the upcoming appointed times. What else we got to talk about? That's it. Yes. All right, let's get to it then. So last week we talked a little bit about, maybe I should just stand back here. You know what I'm saying? I got some room. It's, it's almost more, more room. I don't like the lights. To, oh, my lights ain't on. That's why. So, what's up, Scrap? Sit your butt down, boy. It's showtime. I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> um. So last last week we talked about uh, we talked about uh we finished up. What did we talk about last week? We finished up what oh, prophecy? Yeah. Who remembers? Yeah. I'm about to say he gave you the answer. So we talked about Hosea. Right. Hosea, we finished out all this prophecy. We saw that Hosea was a prophet to Israel. The The second half of the book, um, it focused a lot on prophecy that is to come, talking about, you know, the return of Israel and how the most high God is going to recover all the things that he'd done to us, how he's going to make us his people again. Um, if we if we kind of zoom back into the time that we were dealing with, we had um we had the children of Israel in the in the northern kingdom, right? In the northern kingdom, they were looking at how they disobeyed the Most High God since Jeroboam, right? And since Jeroboam, which was the first king of the northern kingdom, he he put an altar in place in Bethel and another one in Dan, and created golden calves as idols to represent the Most High God, and they had never turned back from that. They had continued that trad tradition. They continue to do those things. And so uh, the Most High God, of course, was angry with us at, at, about that. And then he started to give us prophecy. So to recap some of the prophecy that we got, remember, we got Jonah, right? But Jonah didn't have a prophecy for Israel or Judah. Jonah was a prophet to Nineveh, right? Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, right? So then after that, yeah, what are you doing? Move that. Move that. Sit your butt down and pay attention, right? Um Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. After that, we see that um, Amos came. Amos didn't mention anybody in particular, but Amos said, yo, 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 y'all going to go into captivity and a lot of y'all about to get killed. Right. That's the prophet. That's a that's a summation, a, a huge summation of what Amos had as a prophecy to the northern kingdom. Right. Then after that, we talked about. Hosea. 
and Hosea had a prophecy for for um, uh, the northern kingdom as well. But Hosea said similar things. Hosea said not just you're going to go captive and that a whole bunch of people about to get killed. But Hosea added a little bit. He mentioned Assyria. Right. So you see that things are kind of getting a little bit closer into what's happening. And let's pull up our timeline so we can see. And weekly Sabbath begins evening of the 15th. So two Sabbaths. Uh, they are actually the same. Yeah, they land on the same day. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, no, you're right. Yeah, two Sabbaths. Sorry about that. Do, 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 do. Let's pull this up. And let's get this going. Boom. All righty. So we talked about Jonah so far. All right. Jonah. We talked about Amos. And we talked about Hosea. Right. The next prophet to start is Isaiah. Right. Now, Isaiah started to kick off right before Uzziah died. Y'all remember Uzziah, right? Uzziah also went by Azariah in the book. He had, he was given leprosy. I remember he was given leprosy because at first he was kind of doing what the Most High God wanted him to do. Then he got a little, little too proud. You know what I'm saying? Oh, y'all can't even see what's on the screen here. Let me move it for you. Let me move it. Boom. We're going to change this. Boom, boom, boom. I'll be quiet back there. There we go. Y'all see it now? And we'll put it on the big screen here. All right. Okay. Where you want to start? Uh, we ain't starting yet. I don't know why all my stuff went haywire now. Let's fix this. Put that where it's supposed to be. Cool. All righty. So we have Jonah, Amos, oops, and Hosea. Um, and now today we're going to get into uh, Isaiah. But Isaiah kicked off when Uzziah died, right? So Uzziah was the king of Judah, the southern kingdom, right? He he uh he tried to he tried to you know what i'm saying get a little too proud he walked into the temple and remember he tried to make a sacrifice and it was only given to the priest to make a sacrifice he tried to burn so, the incense. oh yeah sorry yeah he was he is he burning the incense after that um the most high god struck him with uh leprosy remember it was on his forehead boom right where everybody could see it about 60 of the priests freaked out they don't play that stuff because the temple has to stay clean. Anything with lepers had to be away from the house of the Most High God. So then they grabbed him, gaffled him up, put him out. He ended up having to live outside of the tent. I mean, outside of the camp, outside of the uh, the city. And uh, at that point, his son took over, his son Jotham. So Jotham became king while Uzziah was still alive, right? A lot of times the king doesn't come. The next king doesn't come until the king dies. But in this case, Uzziah was still alive and he became king. Uh, Jotham became king. So now, Jotham being the king, Uzziah is still alive for a little while. This is the time period that Isaiah first hit the scene. So that's what we're going to start with. We're not going to start like we usually do at verse chapter one, because Isaiah is unique. Isaiah, a lot of the prophets so far that we have, um, the prophets so far that we talked about, have been prophets kind of to one individual place, 
right? They focus have been one individual place. Isaiah's focus is in Judah, right? But because his book is so big, he has a lot that talks about the northern kingdom as well. So we're going to kind of pick out some of the stuff that he has to say about the northern kingdom first. Um, and then we'll kind of dive into some of the stuff he says about the southern kingdom in Judah. All right. So let's go to Isaiah. This is Isaiah chapter six, verse one. Isaiah chapter six, verse one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above mm -hmm. it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two now listen to what he's describing here, right? So he said he walk in, right? He is like, man, I saw, I saw, what do you see? Uh, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. I saw Yahuwah himself sitting upon a throne right watch this high and lifted up uh-huh his train filled the temple he said in his train filled the temple that means it's like a tail like a tail of cloth like, like a, a train would be you ever seen a, a wedding dress you see a wedding dress and sometimes that that long tail come off of the wedding dress and people got to walk around and hold it so that's a train like a right robe. so think of like huh it's like a king's robe yeah, think of it like a robe or something. So he's sitting on a throne, but he got this long robe or this long tail that's like coming, that's coming around from his clothes, right? So the king's sitting there. What else? Above it stood the seraphims. Mm-hmm. So you have the seraphims. So, you know, normally people say angels. That's why kind of how, how we get called. When we be talking about like, oh, look at this supernatural, you know, being, we call it an angel. So the book doesn't directly call the things that we think of as angels. It doesn't call them angels. Here it calls them seraphims, right? So what happened with the seraphims? Each Watch how it had, describes the seraphims. Each one had six wings. So each seraphim had six wings. You ever seen the picture of the angel? It's like a little, usually like a white man. And he got, he got big old, you know what I'm saying, wings. They like, they belong to like, like doves or something, like yeah, long little, dove wings little, and all that. Little white babies, little, little little white baby. Or you get a little, you get a little white, white baby, you know what I'm saying? Little baby. white baby angels. You know what I'm saying? Look, listen to this description. We're gonna get more descriptions as we keep going. Put those balls down, boy. We're gonna get more descriptions. Just sit down and pay attention. That's all you gotta do. Right? Um, we're gonna get we're gonna get more descriptions as we get to the other prophets. But listen to this description, right? And we gotta keep this in memory when we go and we're gonna put it together with the other descriptions that we get. Right. So he got he got six wings, right? The seraphim. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he did fly. Right? So there are six wings on each seraphim. It said it's two seraphim on each side of Yahuwah, right? So you got a seraphim standing here, right? Then you got a seraphim standing here, right? And this is the throne behind us, right? Then each seraphim has six wings. Y'all can know, Mal, how many wings is this all together? Huh? 12 wings, right? So now each seraphim has six wings. That means it's 12 wings. Now he's telling us how those 12 wings are used, right? With two of the wings, he covers his face. So what's happening is the wing, the top wing, is going out like this and it's covering Yahuwah's face on the throne. So you can't see Yahuwah's face because you got wings that are covering like that, right? And then with two of the wings, they cover his feet, right? So you go like that, and now his feet is covered. And then the other two wings, they used to fly, right? So these are flapping. All right, keep going. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahuwah of hosts. The whole mm -hmm. earth is full of his glory. Mm -hmm. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I mm -hmm. dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, Yahuwah of hosts. Right? So now you have to understand, Isaiah's sitting here, he's never seen the, I like to believe that this is Isaiah's first little interaction. Right? This is probably the, like, this is how I look at it, right? This is probably the first time the Most High God called him out. 
right? So Isaiah died, Isaiah probably minded his business, and then he get this vision. And he like, oh, wow, that's actually the man. That's him. He's sitting right there. I see this seraphim. I see this seraphim. They're covering their face. He immediately feels convicted by that because that's what happens. Right? And don't think of that as a strange thing because if you think about some of our friends and family or even how you may have felt the first time that you saw a righteous person, right? You start to feel like automatically you start to think about your positioning, right? When we, when we start to behave correctly and we say, you know what? I'm going to leave a lot of this stuff alone. A lot of people around us look at us like we judging them. Like, what you trying to say? You too good now? You used to do this all the time. Oh, now all of a sudden you X, Y, and Z. Because that's what happens. So that's what's happening to Isaiah right now. He's feeling it because he's around real righteousness. He's feeling like, oh, I'm unrighteous. Right? It's important for us to understand that dynamic. It's a good thing when people react to us this way. That's a good sign. That ought to give us hope. I know it hurts that sometimes our family feel like they're rejecting us. And it hurt that sometimes, you know what I'm saying, our friends feel like, you know what I'm saying, they kind of turning things and making it difficult to us. They're not supporting us in the thing. Like, we want all our friends to come to Bible study. Right? We want all our, all our friends to tune in. We want all our friends to keep the, the appointed times. That's cool. Right? That's cool. But the idea that what they do is they look at us and they say, you know what? No, I don't even want to be around you no more. And they start to separate themselves from us. That's a good sign. Right. Because the book tells us that those who want to live in darkness shy away from the light. So that's a sign that perhaps we are starting to admit light. You can't rest on that. Right. Don't look around. Don't try to measure yourself and say, OK, well, I'm more righteous by as many friends that don't want to be around. Because sometimes it's some foolish people I don't want to be around. Right. So you can't rest on that. But that's a good sign as you start to change your life. Right. And that's the same thing that Isaiah is feeling. He's feeling, I'm around people who are more righteous than me. I got the two seraphim and Yahuwah himself sitting right there. Then they start singing out, holy, 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 and telling us how great this man is that's sitting here. He, he, look, he looking like, I don't belong here. He tell, I'm a man of unclean lips and from a land where people got unclean lips. In other words, all of us be cussing and lying and running our darn mouth. Right? And now he recognizes that. That was true before he got there, right? But now it's recognized because he's standing and looking at the bar. He's looking at the, he's looking at the, the idea of what righteousness is. And so now it calls everything out of you into account, right? So let's see how, let's see how the Most High God deals with this. Brother Justin Ooh. in the house, what's going on, brother? Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a mm -hmm. man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And mm -hmm. My eyes have seen the king, Yahuwah of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Mm -hmm. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Mm -hmm. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Oh, well, we missed something, though. Go back real quick. Go back to right before, uh, go, go back a couple of verses, maybe three or four verses. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal. Uh, no, go back a little more, another three or four. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean uh, Another three or four. And one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is Yahuwah of hosts. Maybe two more. How about we just start at one then? Where are we at if, I, if we go back two more? One. Oh, okay, yeah, let's do one then. I feel in like year, we missed something. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Uh-huh. And his train filled the temple. Uh-huh. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With mm -hmm. two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his feet. And with two, he did fly. Mm-hmm. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy. Is Yahuwah of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Mm -hmm. The post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. Right. So now, listen, 
It said the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. Right? What does that mean? The post of the doors move. Jacob. Look, you ever heard something? Look, you ever you ever been like, you know what I'm saying? You ever been in the house watching TV or something? Then all of a sudden, you feel, you know what I'm saying? You feel your house start to shake a little bit, like boom, boom, boom. Then they get closer and closer, and you hear somebody outside, and they playing, you know what I'm saying? Boom, 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 boom. But you can feel a house shake. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Them boy, them boy come listen. I used to have this little scion, right? You know what I'm saying? A little scion. Yeah, the, you know what I'm saying? Had the two the two fifteens in the back. You know what I'm saying? No, it wasn't two. I'm lying. That wasn't two fifteen. It was two tens and that two fifteen probably would have towed that little car apart. Right. But I had, you know what I'm saying? Two tens in the back. And I'll come down that thing. Boom. Boom. You know what I'm saying? The whole block on here. Right? Because that's how it worked. Well, that's what's happening here. He's saying the post of the doors are shaking. Right? You can hear your house shake when that happens. So this, you can hear the door right here. You know what I'm saying? Like the little outline of the door. You can hear that shaking where in the room that he's in, right? When the mo- when 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 the uh, seraphim were speaking and giving praise to the Most High God. Keep going. Watch this. <clears throat> and the house was filled with smoke. Then said and what I, happened? The house was filled with smoke. Right. So they started to give glory to the Most High God. And the house became filled with smoke. Right? That's important because where, what does this remind us of? The cloud by day and the fire by night. And when the cloud by day. Yeah, that's well, kind of. Yeah, let's go Moses, to, uh, let's Moses, go to. When, uh, when Moses uh, did the sacrifice to sanctify the people, the temple would fill with smoke. When he built the, when he built the tabernacle. He built it. Right? Yeah, so let's go to the end of Exodus. Exodus chapter 40. Give me about verse 32. This is Exodus chapter 40, about verse 32. That's his presence. That's right, Sister Pamela. Right? That's his presence that we're talking about. It's important to recognize this because this is going to tell you where Isaiah is. A lot of, listen, there's a lot of people read this book, but until you start to understand the similitudes of the Most High God, that's when you had the answers that the Most High God is just not putting flat on the page for us. It's a lot of stuff in this book that's not flat on the page, right? But I want to make sure that we understand based off of only based. based on, it's a lot of other stuff that's that we haven't read yet that gives context to this 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 uh this interaction also. But we're not gonna go to the stuff we haven't read. We only gonna talk about the stuff we've already read, right? So let's look at Exodus chapter forty, verse thirty-two. Watch what we see here. When they went into the tent, the congregation, when they went into the tent of the congregation, and when they came near unto the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and right. the hanging of the court gate. Uh-huh. So Moses finished the work. Moses did what? Finished the work. What work did he finish? The tabernacle being built. He, he finished building the tabernacle. He reared up the outer gate. Right. So you remember our tab- tabernacle was this big old tent and then outside of it, we had to set up the gate. Right. To make sure we set up a burial. He he reared that up. So he finished it. He finished the work. The book is saying, watch what happened next. And when Moses was not able to enter and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of Yahuwah filled the tabernacle. Mm-hmm. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud so after was- Moses finished building the tabernacle, immediately after that, the glory of the Most High God filled it in the cloud. The cloud that that Brother T was just talking about that followed and guide, guided the the children of Israel. The cloud came down and it filled it up. Boy, stop making your eyes crooked like that before they get stuck, right? So they're going, you know what I'm saying? It, it filled up the whole tabernacle and nobody could be in there. Right? Nobody could be in there. Ain't that what it just said? Yeah. Read it again for me. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Mm-hmm. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. So now it's another time that we saw this. Who remembers the second time that we saw it? Uh, 
Man, hold on. I think with Joshua. Joshua? Did it happen with Joshua too? I don't know about Joshua, but we do have um, we do have Solomon, right? So let's go to Second Kings, Second Kings chapter eight. Let's just try verse eight. Let's try eight and eight. This is Second Kings chapter eight, verse eight. We might have started one, but Second Kings chapter eight, verse eight. And they drew out the staves that the ends of the staves were seen out of the holy place before the oracle, and they mm -hmm. were not seen without, and there they are unto this day. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when Yahuwah made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of Yahuwah. So, so the look, the same thing had happened. So this is right after... Solomon had the temple built, right? So the temple was finished being built. They put the ark inside of the, the holy place. And now when the priests were coming out, what happened? Keep and reading. Out, oh, and there was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there in Horeb when Yahuwah made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And mm -hmm. came fast when the priests were come out of the holy place but the cloud filled the house of Yahuwah. Right? So now the cloud filled because of the cloud. And what happened? For the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Right? So because that cloud was in there, nobody could be in there. Right? Now, let's go back to Isaiah. We're going to see a difference here. The seraphim and Yahuwah are there. The smoke fills it. But guess what? They're able to stay. Right. Because we're not dealing with people replicating the temple of heaven. Isaiah is in the temple. He's in the same place. You remember when when Moses was Mo, when Moses was given given the patterns for the tabernacle, the most high God told him where the patterns came from. What did he tell him? Who remembers? The patterns came from you. Uh, the makings after what's in heaven. He told him that these things are after that which is in heaven. Right? The designs that David got for the temple came from the Most High God specifically. Right? The Most High God gave him those designs. The things that we were doing was based off of what came, what's in heaven. Isaiah is having a vision about the actual temple. In the actual temple, you have the Most High God who is righteous and you have the seraphim, right? They didn't have to leave. When the glory of the Most High God is in that state, that's the actual thing. You didn't have to leave. We have to leave because we're not worthy to be in the presence of the Most High God. Nor was Isaiah until this coal was given to him. So let's keep reading through the coal. You there, Brother T? Yeah. yeah. Isaiah chapter uh, 6. What verse we leave off on? We should be about where they give them the verse, coal. Verse 4. All right. This is Isaiah chapter 6, verse 4. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then uh -huh. I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And so I'm notice what just happened, right? When when the the tabernacle filled with, with smoke, everybody got out, right? When the uh, temple filled with, with the cloud and with the glory of the Most High God, the priests got out and they, they couldn't minister, right? Now, when the, the, temp, the actual temple, the vision that Isaiah is having of the actual temple in heaven, when that fills with the smoke, he immediately start feeling guilt. He looked like, oh, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm a man of unclean lips. Right? Keep going. Watch this. 
and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen Yahuwah the king, Yahuwah of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also, Keep I going. heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Right, so now the Most High God is asking the question openly. Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? That's similar to the question that was asked uh, in the vision that, uh, what's his name, Micaiah, I think it was, the prophet Micaiah. Micaiah seen concerning Ahab, the king. Yeah, when he was, when he was, uh, had the, the prophecy for Ahab, right? So it's very similar. He said, man, who going to go down there and, you know what I'm saying, cause him to go to this war and get, have himself killed? And he ended up sending the lion spirit. So in the same way, the most high God calls out and he say, who's going to go for us? But Isaiah is there in his vision. He said, I'll do it. Right. So let's see. Then I said, here am I. Send me. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy. And sure their, shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed right so in other words he just told he just told the people i'm setting you up he said you're gonna hear something but ain't even gonna realize what you heard and you're gonna see something and not even gonna realize what you saw you're not gonna understand these things is what he's telling right Un this is so important to me i want you guys to understand the bible the scripture the word of god is setting the expectation with you, the reader of this, the believer of this, that you will not understand. That's the expectation that is set. He's saying, look, this people, they're going to see stuff and not even realize what they saw. Read it one more time. I want, to, I want, to, I want this to sink in because it's going to be a theme throughout the book of Isaiah. Right? Keep going. Go and tell this people. Hear ye indeed, but understand not. Mm -hmm. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Mm -hmm. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, unless they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. So as long as we are in a state that we're not understanding, and that we don't get it, and that we're not seeing or perceiving what we see, we don't have understanding behind what's being presented to us. That is in the state of being entrapped by the most high God. He's saying, unless they see with their eyes and they end up being converted. So at the point that we start to actually understand what we read and understand what we see, then he's saying, then you'll be delivered. That's the goal for us. We have to persevere through that, that, that that phase of not understanding it, not getting it, right? We talk about all the time. This is this is why you have books about the book, right? This is why people write books, and this is why why people at the bottom you got a whole book, right? A whole scripture, all this stuff written, translated into all these different languages, and then these people put at the bottom of it commentary. That verse means X, Y, and Z. You got people explaining in a book what the book is saying. Right. In any other situation, this is stupid and doesn't make any sense. Right. If you go buy right now, go buy. You know what I'm saying? What's a book? What's a good book? Who knows a good book? Give me a good book. I can't think of one. I don't be reading. Harry Potter, the Sorcerer's Stone. If you go get you say, you know what? Harry Potter, that's a good book. You enjoy that book. OK, that's a good book. So Harry Potter, the Sorcerer's Stone. What sense does it make now? To take that great book and then somebody else write over that book and tell you what that book means. This, when Harry Potter said abracadabra, what he really means is X, Y, and Z. You'd be looking at it like, I can read, that's obvious, right? Like I can, I'm reading the book. I like reading the book. Imagine watching a movie, right? And in the movie, stop it. You see somebody pop on the screen. So let me tell you what that scene meant. 
You see the protagonist. Ain't that what it's called? A protagonist? The antagonist and the protagonist? You yeah. see the protagonist is under attack by the antagonist. He's antagonizing. You know what I'm talking about? Then you try to look at it and you're like, I can see the darn movie. Get it back to plan. Right? Well, that's what happens with the book because people don't understand it. So that's why almost every Bible, I tell people all the time, man, you get, you, get yourself a Bible. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you get a Bible where it ain't got nothing in it but the scripture. You know what I'm saying? Not all that commentary at the bottom, people telling you what stuff means. Because these people don't know what they're talking about. And because it's in the Bible, your mind, your mind to tell you that's just as fact as God's word. That's how Satan be getting us. Because we read it, we'll read the most high God's word. Then we'll say, hmm, let me see, you know what I'm saying? Let me see what that means. And we go down there and we read you know what I'm saying? Susan K. Ellen, who, you know what I'm saying, who wrote the commentary. You know what I'm saying? Okay, Susan K. Ellen says that this, that, and other. Then we start, we start to forget who Susan K. Ellen is. We forget that she's just a woman. She's just a regular person, just like anyone else. But her, her, her words are written right next to the word of the most high God. And so we start to count them as the same thing. It's dangerous. I tell you, don't you know, get rid of them Bible with commentary in it. It's okay. No, it's okay to go read what people think about the Bible. That's fine. Right? You want to get online and read, but make sure it's separate. Because you need you have to give yourself every chance not to be deceived. Right? We are in an era of where my son is. We are in an era of deception. The pizza guy. We are in an era of deception. Right? That's what it is. It's just pure deception. So we have to put ourselves, we have to give ourselves every advantage to make sure that we can mentally handle understanding the truth, accepting the truth, and moving through it. Let's keep going. So another thing you might want to point out, he said, make this, make the heart of the people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes. So mm -hmm. like brother was saying, God is purposely saying, shut them all off. Cut them off from being able to be delivered at this time. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and houses without man, and land be utterly desolate. Mm -hmm. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Mm -hmm. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree and as an mm -hmm. oak whose substance in them is in them. And when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be substance thereof. All right. So he said, even though he going, he telling us that there's going, he, uh, Isaiah asked a specific question. He's like, okay, how long are these people not going to pay attention? How long are these people not going to understand these things? He said, oh man, it's going to be a while. I mean, until the land is like completely desolate, right? It ain't going to be nobody. It ain't going to be nobody in the land. But he's like, but nevertheless, it's kind of going to be like a teal tree or an oak tree, right? Where the seed is of itself, right? So he's saying this thing, this seed, there's still going to be a tent there or there's still going to be a seed there. And that seed is going to repopulate. Watch, he'll explain it to us. Watch this. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that reason the son of Syria and Pekah, the son of Remliah, king of Israel, went up towards Jerusalem to war against it, but could not mm -hmm. prevail against it. So y'all remember we read about Pekah, right? That was a couple weeks ago, but we read about Pekah. Pekah was uh, a son of uh, Remliah. Remliah, but he came after uh, Pekahiah, right? So let me let me go ahead and put this back on the screen so we can quickly recap over this one. So y'all remember Pika, Pika right here, right? So Pika is right here, right? So he was a king. We ended up reading about him being a king and then him dying. I think he died at the hand of Assyria, right? So Pika's here and Pika is teaming up with Reason, right? Reason is the king of Damascus. The king of Syria, not Assyria, but Damascus, so Syria. So that's just north of us. So if we put that one on the map, we'll look at it from right here, right? So you have Damascus right here, and then you have the king uh, Pekah. They are teaming together, 
And then they're coming against Jerusalem. Right? So now this is a prophecy that's going to Isaiah as a result of the Most High God knowing this is about to happen. The Most High God is kind of giving Isaiah a lowdown of what's about to happen. Right? So watch this. We haven't read this yet. We'll read it. I want to read this first because this happens first. Right? So let's, let's look at it. You there, Brother T? Hello? I feel like I lost him. Let me see. Brother T, can you hear me? My bad. I was it was on mute. Oh. And it and it was told to the house of David saying, Syria's confederate with Ephraim. Mm -hmm. His heart was moved in the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Mm -hmm. Then said Yahuwah unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jeshub thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And right. Him, so he told him to go meet Ahaz. So, real quick, I want to talk about who Ahaz is. Right. So, Ahaz comes after Jotham. So, remember, Jotham is the son of Uzziah. Uzziah got leprosy. At the end of Isaiah's life, that's when Isaiah started to uh, started, you know, what I'm saying started to prophesy. Then you have Jotham. Jotham then dies, and then you have Ahaz. Again, we going we haven't read about Ahaz yet, and we're gonna read about him. But uh, this is this is who the Most High God is telling Isaiah to meet with because this is who's the king at the time that of what we're reading right now, right? So we've skipped all the way over jo Jotham, and now Isaiah is talking about a time where Ahaz was alive. Let's keep going. And say unto him, take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted for the two mm -hmm. tales of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remliah. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it, even the mm -hmm. son of Tabiel, thus says Yahuwah God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the right, so the Most High God is telling Isaiah, listen, these boys are teaming up against you, and they're going to come, right? But tell Ahaz, don't be afraid of that mess, because it's not going to happen. I know what they're trying to do, but it's not going to happen, right? Let's see. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. And within mm -hmm. 65 years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. Right? So he said, within 65 years, he said? Three score and five years. Right? He said, within 65 years, Ephraim is not even going to be a people. Who told us that first? Hosea. Hosea told us. He said, listen, it will, in the, he said, I am, he said, have a son and name him not my people because Israel will not be my people. And this is what now Isaiah is coming from. You have to understand that we're going to end up learning that the prophets have to stand on the prophets, right? So what a prophet, uh, what one true prophet say has to be in line with what the previous true prophet said. They can't contradict. They ain't got to be saying the exact same thing. They can always give different details. But it can't contradict. Right? At that point, you got to kind of sit back and be like, man, I don't know what y'all talking about. Right? So at this point, we hearing the same thing from Hosea. Remember, they living at the same time. But we hearing the same thing from Hosea and Isaiah. Right? He's like, man, listen, y'all not going to be a people in 65 years. But look how more specific it gets over time. First, you got Jonah, who don't say nothing about Israel. Just say, yo, I'm about to get rid of Nineveh. Okay, most high God repent for that because Nineveh repented. Great. Then you have Amos. Amos don't get no names. He just let there's some bad stuff about to happen. 
Then you got Hosea. He started to give more detail. Like, uh, you're going in captivity and you're not going to be a people and Assyria going to have something to do with it. Right? Now we're getting into Isaiah. He telling us, yo, 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 it's going to be 65 years. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's giving them a time. Like, within 65 years, this thing about to be done for you. All right, let's keep going. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remliah's son. Mm -hmm. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Moreover, Yahuwah spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask the sign of Yahuwah, my God, thy God. Ask it either in depth or in height above. But Ahaz said, I will not, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Right? So he told Ahaz, he was like, listen, I know what I'm telling you, heart. Cause look, the most high God know this is scary stuff. You got two boys, you got whispers of two boys coming out. They about to knock your darn block off. They know what's about to happen. You know these boys with that business. So you looking at it like, mm, so most I got already know. Like, listen, I know you're going to be scared of these boys when they come. So ask of me a sign to give you more confidence. But Ahaz, he act like a darn Christian. Oh, no, I have faith, Lord. You know, a Christian be lying. You know what I'm saying? You know, a Christian be lying about, listen. Is one thing as Christians that kept us from the most high God. We 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 was lied to. It's one thing as Christians that kept us from the most high God. And that is not being able to admit that the most high God is working against us or that a situation is bad. We think that that's humility. And in Christianity, we think that's humility, right? We think it's humility to be like, well, I didn't go on through all this, but you know, God is still teaching me a lesson or, or, you know, it had I not gone through that, I wouldn't be where I am now. Or, you know, Hey, it's bad, but Hey, at least God woke me up this morning. Right. Thank God. I mean, Oh, you know, my life is horrible and I feel bad and everything sucks, but you know what? I still thank God for everything in my life. In our mind, that is humility. Oh, I've been put through the ringer and, you know, I've been under attack. But I tell you what, God ain't never left my side. We say all that foolishness thinking we thinking that is like, oh, we giving glory to God or we having humility when we say that. But that's a lie from from Satan. That is not how it works. The most high God want to hear us say. God has walked away from me. And I have walked away from him. He wants us to acknowledge our sin and acknowledge what's happening to us as a result of our sin. And if we feel like we ain't sin, then we should have an attitude. Of, if you read the whole book of Job, show me one place where Job thanked God for what he was going through. Show me one place where God was like, I mean, where Job was like, yo, yo, yo. you know what I'm saying? Look, I'm, I'm being put through it. I got, I got these boils on my skin. All my kids is dead. All my riches is gone. But you know what? Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for being born. Did Job say thank you for being born or did he say something else? He said curse the day I was born. He said curse the day I was darn born. We look at it all backward. We thanking God for life. While a righteous man is saying curse the day I was born. And at the end of the day, the Most High God looked at him and said, you are righteous. This is a righteous man. We have the whole thing backwards. It's a setup, what we're dealing with, because we don't see, we don't perceive the stuff that we see. We don't understand the stuff that we hear. And we just run our mouth and talk and say stuff and move too quick. All we got to do is slow down. All we got to do is slow down. We got to do the needful thing and just learn the book. Make sure we got an understanding of the book and make sure it's a confident understanding of the book. Once we do that, then we can move around. We can start talking, start running our darn mouth. But until then, let's shut up. Let's just look at it. What is the book saying? Let's get it. And let me just talk about what I understand in the book. It gets very, very dangerous because these people jump out and they start moving too quick. And that's what got all of us in the same state that we in now, right? We had Israelites teaching Gentiles. 
Gentiles got split from the Israelites. Now it are now the Gentiles got to try to improvise of what this is. So they start calling it Christianity. And they start mixing it with pagan religions. And they start teaching it to all a Gentile people. Then Gentiles then fast forward, start to enslave us. Then they send us in slavery to all, all of the nations. Then guess what? Then they start teaching us this foolishness that they actually learned from our ancestors. Now we got black Christian pastors, the same blood that we got, but they teaching Gentile teaching. It gets dangerous because we just repeat this stuff and repeat this stuff and repeat it. But we never audit what we speak and what we learn against what the scripture says. That's what's necessary. That's the needful thing. That we start to look at our life, look at our words, look at our thoughts. And we say, you know what? Does this line up with the book? Do I find examples of this with the book? And if we don't, get rid of it. A lot of this stuff that we that we've been repeating, you won't find it. You have to be able to have real humility. Real humility is not, oh, you know, I know I messed up, but God was with me the whole time. No, real humility is I sinned. And the reason why I've been going through all this foolishness in my life is because I'm rebellious. The reason why the most I got, I got to keep teaching me a lesson is because I keep doing the same mistakes. Because I lust after sin. I keep wanting the same sin and then all of a sudden the same things keep happening to me and manifesting themselves in my life in different ways and I'm suffering because of it. You keep telling yourself that God is by your side and God is with you. There's no incentive for you to change. You believe this foolishness that you say. The most high God knows this about us. And he knew it about Ahaz. That's why he tried to give Ahaz. He like, Ahaz, listen, ask for a sign. And what does Ahaz say? Nah, I don't need no sign. I believe you, Lord. Right? But watch what the most high God do because he know. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Mm -hmm. He said, hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Right? He said, man, you listen, you giving men a hard time. You know what I'm talking about? Listen, I understand. Look, it's a it's not small for you to weary men. He said, he's asked him, is it a small thing for you to weary men? Is it a, a small thing just for you to give people a hard time? You giving people a hard time. But you about to give me a hard time too? I'm telling you what to do. I'm telling you, ask me. I'm not, I'm telling you to ask me for a sign. And now you, oh, no, no, I don't want to tempt the Lord. That's false humility. That's not real humility. The man is telling you what to do. Sit your butt down and do it, right? But watch this. Keep going. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, Look. a virgin shall, con shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Butter and honey shall he eat that he mm -hmm. may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Right? So what sign did he just give us? Oh, sure. He gave us the sign of the Messiah. Emmanuel, the name, that name in Hebrew means God is with us. Right? So he's, he's the message that he's given right now is, listen, a virgin is going to give birth. And that is the sign. And that kid's name is going to be God is with us. Right? Keep going. Watch this. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Mm -hmm. before and before child, what? For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Mm-hmm. So he's telling us right here, both kings going to be gone. Right? What else he got for Ahaz? 
And the Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the mm -hmm. kingdom of Syria. And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahuwah shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. Mm -hmm. and they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys, in the holes and in the rocks and upon the thorns and upon bushes. Mm -hmm. In the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head of the hair of the, yeah. of the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. It shall not come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep. And it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give, that they shall give, he sh that they shall give, he shall eat butter. For butter and honey shall every one eat that is left in the land. And it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be where there were a thousand vines and a thousand silverlings, it shall even be for briars and thorns. With mm -hmm. arrows and with bowls shall men come here because all the land shall become briars and thorns. And right. All all so he's telling them, listen, the prophecy up to this point has mostly been about Israel. Eli, listen, Judah, he's in the message of what he's given is here's a sign. Judah going to get it too. Right? Keep going. Watch this. And on the hills that shall, and on all hills that shall be digged with the mattock, there shall not come there the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for ascending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. Keep going. Moreover, Yahuwah said unto me, Take thee a great roll and write in it, in a man's pen concerning Meher Shalahashbaz. And I took unto me faithful witness of record, Uriah the priest, and Zechariah the son of Jebrekiah. Jebrekiah, Jebrekiah. And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said Yahuwah to me, Call his name Meher Shalahashbaz. For behold, the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. All right. So listen, the most high God said, listen, have a, he, look, Isaiah went and he had a baby. Right. And then the most high God said, listen, name your, your baby. I forget what this name means. Um, I forgot. I forget. Yeah, I forget. I forget what this name means. I'll look it up right now, though. I, I forget what the name means. But he said, name your kids. Say the name for me because I can. that one difficult. Name her Shalal Hash Baz. Right? And then, look what he said next. Keep reading. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother. He said, now before the child can even, like, learn the mama and learn to say, hey, ma, daddy. Right? What's going to happen? The riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Israel, uh, Syria. Right? So he's saying, listen, before this baby is old enough to start crying, Israel is out of here. You see, as we start to get closer, the prophecy becomes more, more clear and more explicit. I say that for a reason. There is going to be prophets that come and guide us through what the Most High God is going to do. Right? The Most High God has already told us at a very high level, very vague, but he's told us that he's going to recover us from all the countries that he drove us out to. Right? Right now, we don't have a ton of detail, specifics around it. We don't know what the timing is, nor did they know what the timing was until Isaiah came. And when Isaiah came, Isaiah was like, look, it's going to be within, I don't know exactly, going to be within 65 years. Then look how quickly that escalated. He said 65 years when we was talking about um, uh, Isaiah, right, during Jotham's time. Then we talking about Ahaz, and all of a sudden, now it's like, yo, before your baby, you know what I'm saying, before your baby learn how to talk good. Before your baby started talking about mama, daddy, he said, all oh, this thing, your baby ain't even going to be able to say mama, daddy before this thing gets done. Right? 
So the name, the name means uh So the main the name is basically like uh like the spoils of war. You know what I'm saying? So pretty much when you have when you go to war, you know what I'm saying, you take everything from that country. Right? So I go to war, I conquer it, I take your money, I take your resources, I own all your stuff, right? And that that what you own is called the spoils, right? That's what they call it. They call it the spoils of war. So he the, the name means quick like quick spoils right quick prey or quick quick booty is another way to call it right booty is what they call it but that's called spoils right you you kind of get it and that's what you take right so he said quick spoils I'm taking this quickly right so what's the message that the Most High God is giving with this name? He said Assyria gonna take all of Damascus and Israel stuff quickly. Mm -hmm quickly now it makes sense why he said before the baby is even able to say mama and daddy right before that happened it's gonna be done right so let's keep reading i just want y'all to see how specific things become right because this is the expectation that we gotta have as we start to get closer right when things start to play out expect there to be a prophet and expect there to be some 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 specifics in that prophecy all right it's gonna be a lot of weird i expect there to be a lot of weirdness going on the true prophet everybody gonna be saying is the false prophet it's gonna be false prophets that everybody gonna be saying is the true prophet right i need us to be able to differentiate between what's real and what's not real and the only way to do that is to guide ourselves based off of what the prophecy has said of old what I expect is that there will not just right now we look at this and we kind of see a prophet doing miracles and we say, OK, OK, that's the prophet because he did a miracle. I expect that the false prophet and the true prophet are going to be doing miracles based off of what I read in Revelations. Right. So we need to be able to base our understanding based off of the word. Right. On top of the miracles and on top of the signs that the Most High God is going to give us, it needs to all line up with what the words say so that we aren't, we aren't deceived. And so all these details that we look at, it's important for us, right? Latch on to them, remember them, kind of see how things go. Because when you start to see this stuff and if the Most High God give us, you know what I'm saying, get, you know, ha have, have it in our plans for us to see, you know what I'm saying, how the, how the prophet of our time is going to come, right? If it be our time, then... um. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna have to we gonna have to be ready for that. We're gonna have to be ready to kind of understand what the differences are. Keep going. The Lord spake also unto me, saying, For as much as this people refuses the waters of Shiloh that go softly and rejoice in reason and Rimliah's son, now therefore behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria. And all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over go over all his banks. And he shall so listen, channel, banks, all these are 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 symbolism for water. All right? So he's 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 describing Assyria like a flood. All right, pretty much what he's saying. So when you say like a channel is 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 like uh think of it like a, a river, a way a way to guide water, kind of like a river. So you might build something like, let's say back in the day, we didn't have like sprinklers and stuff, right? So what you would do is you would take the river and you would dig a hole or dig like a ditch kind of from the river. So the water, instead of flowing through the river, it'll go to the area that you dig. And so you dig a channel all the way to where you want the water to go. So you want the water to, to water your field, you'll dig this channel and then the water will leave from the river and start going into your channel and it'll start watering the field. And if you want more water, you dig deep. If you only want a little bit of water, then you make the, 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 what you dig shallow, right? And then it'll go into the channel and it'll, it'll then start to water your field or you'll have water that'll come drop by your house or something, right? So think of it that way. This is what he's describing. He's describing water. But what he's talking about is a nation of people. That is something to remember as well, right? 
Notice how the Most High God describes these nations that take over places quickly. He describes it as a flood. This is going to be something that we continue to see throughout prophecy, not just from Isaiah. All right, keep going. He shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even the neck. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, all ye of far countries. Gird mm -hmm. yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. And gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Take right, so now he's, he's giving the world notice, too. He's like, it ain't going to just be Israel. It's going to be all these nations that's around. He said, all y'all going to have to bow down to Assyria is what he's telling them. All right, keep going. Take counsel together and it shall come to nothing. Speak the word and it shall not stand. God is with us. For Yahuwah spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them who this people shall say a confederacy. Be Look, the, the people were paranoid. Yahuwah. When they say con confederacy, think of like, think of like, oh, they teaming up against me. Yeah. Everybody, all right? They can, they, they, you know, what I'm saying, these boys, these, these boys working up, they working together against me, right? So the most I got is saying, don't, don't get to saying confederacy to all the, all the stuff that these people say confederacy to. He telling you separate yourself from them. Most I God gave him the real confederacy. The real confederacy is reason, the king, the the king of uh, Syria, king of Damascus, and he's teaming up with the king of Israel to attack Judah. That's the real one. That's the most high. That's the most high God said. But the people are paranoid. They think about, oh, he working with the Assyrians and the Assyrians working with the Edomites. And there's that another. And they said, listen, do not get into that stuff is what the most high God told Isaiah. Watch. Keep going. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Mm -hmm. Sanctify Yahuwah of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him mm -hmm. be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of a of stumbling and for a rock of offense of both the houses of Israel, both the houses of Israel for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. What's a gin and a snare? Trap. A trap. He said, I will be a trap to both the houses. Right? That is important for us. He's gonna be a trap to Judah. Judah also, remember. A lot of this stuff we've been talking about is Israel, the northern tribe so far. But he's telling, I'm going to be a trap to Judah also. He said the whole land going to be desolate. That means Judah going to be going also. So he's starting to give prophecy of more things to come. Right? Keep going. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Mm-hmm. Remember that phrase? We're going to hear that again. Bind up the testimony. He said, bind up the testimony. What's the testimony? The, the scriptures right so so far what we looking at is we have all of the law which is like genesis through uh deuteronomy which we already read then we got joshua and that takes us into judges and then during that time we read the book of ruth right then from ruth we got into the book of samuel there's two books of samuel that takes that took us into kings and chronicles Right. Then we had prophets. So you got the book of Jonah. Then you got the book of, um, of Hosea. I'm sorry, Amos. And then the book of Hosea. I don't know if they would have had the book of Kings at this time, though. Huh? I don't think they would have had the book of Kings at this time, though. No, not the whole book of Kings and Chronicles, but they, they would have had whatever was documented at that time. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have all these things that go. Yeah. These are all testimony. Yeah. That's why it's not yeah. calling it a book. They would have Proverbs, right? they would have Proverbs too. No. They would have Proverbs. They would have a lot of the Psalms, right? Not all of them, but you would have some of the Psalms, right? A lot of them, right? So all these things are testimonies, right? That's the reason why he didn't call it a book, because at this point, it wasn't a Bible or a book like how we look at it right now. It's just a collection of testimonies. And so then he's telling him to do what? Bind up the testimony. What does bind up mean? Like, like bind it up, gather it up. Pull it together. All this stuff is scattered. The book of the Kings, at this point, it's just some people writing some stuff down. It's just like, oh, okay, well, you know what I'm saying? This is what this king did. In order to get the book of Kings, one person or a group of people or whatever had to go and gather all of the writings that 
that they could find over all the years for the kings. And they had to pull it together. Same thing with the Proverbs. You had to take all these different Proverbs. Most of them was from, from Solomon, but there were some from other people. You had to take all these different Proverbs and pull them together. Same thing with the Psalms. A lot of them were from David, but there were some from other people, even going back to Moses. You had to take all of these different Psalms and pull them together. So now he's telling Isaiah, bind up the testimonies. Right? Amos, Hosea, Jonah, whatever you can find, bring it together and then do what? Seal the law among my disciples. Seal the law among my what? Disciples. But we still call ourselves Hebrew Israelites. And we still call ourselves Christians and Muslims and Jewish. Those are not words that describe what the Most High God called us to be. He called us to be disciples. Seal it among my disciples. Those are the ones, my set apart disciples. Those are the ones who are going to understand these testimonies. It's no different from what Yahushua said. If we were to fast forward, Yahushua said, listen, I hearing these other people, the Christians, the followers, these other people hearing, they don't hear. And seeing, they don't, they don't perceive. The same thing that Isaiah said. All this stuff connect. Yahushua quoted that right back to the people. And he said, but the disciples is different because they do understand it. And now Isaiah is saying the same thing here. Take all the testimonies and seal it. In other words, keep it, hide it, protect it amongst my disciples. So when we talk about at the beginning of this, when Isaiah was saying, listen, these people are going to see it and they're not going to really understand what they're seeing. They're going to hear and they ain't going to understand what they're hearing. Lest they end up hearing and seeing and be converted. The disciple piece is the lest, right? That once you become a disciple, that's when you start to see it. That has to be what we strive towards. That's, that's what we have to, that's the superstition that we got to have. All right, I want to be a disciple. Because that's where the promise is. There's no promise to being a Christian. You're not going to find one promise to being a Muslim. Right? There's a lot of people that call themselves Jews that's going to go right to hell. The promise that we have is to be in a disciple of the Messiah. That's what we have to walk in. Right? Keep going. We still got a little bit to go. Find up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait upon Yahuwah that, holds, that hides his face from the house of Jacob. And I will mm -hmm. look for him. Behold, I and the children whom Yahuwah have given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from Yahuwah of hosts. Which Who is talking right now? Home. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto Listen, who is talking right now? The Messiah. That's the Messiah talking. I and the children who Yahuwah have given me shall do what? Are for signs and wonders. In Israel. That's talking about the Messiah. And that's talking about the disciples of the Messiah. When he's telling you about the disciples, still in amongst the disciples, he's telling you about us, disciples of the Messiah. Keep going. Watch this. Behold, I and the children whom Yahuwah has given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwell in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mm. mutter, shall not a people seek unto their God? If you need an answer, today? shouldn't you seek unto your God? Who else tried to do that? Saul. Saul. Yep. Saul. Remember Saul? Saul, he, he was looking for uh, familiar spirits because he wanted to talk to Samuel, right? And he wanted to talk to Samuel because Samuel was the one that gave him guidance, usually gave him guidance about God, right? So what he did is he was like, well, in order for me to get to Samuel, I, he's dead now, so I need to get familiar spirits. So he got, he got somebody who can call on the familiar spirits, and that's how he tried to talk to Samuel, 
Right? Who else? What about Jeroboam? Yeah. Right. Remember Jeroboam? His son was about to die. And he sent he sent for uh he sent for uh his people to go all the way into uh, Damascus, I think it was. Yeah, if some guy. He, there. Yeah, he sent them to go, you know what I'm saying, go up north. I think it was uh was it Dogon? Yeah, he yeah. said he sent them to go up north. Right? And the most high God was like, you know what I'm saying? What is there not a prophet in Israel? Matter of fact, that may not have been Jer that may not have been Jeroboam. That may have been later than Jeroboam. That was yeah, I think in, uh, that was in Elijah's day. Yeah, that may have that, that was later than Elijah, Jeroboam. Eli Elijah might have said that to Ahab. He was like, "Is it that is it because there's not a God in Israel that you went yeah. all the way?" It was probably Amri or Ahab. Yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah, he he came back. You know what I'm saying? He was looking like you know what I'm saying what because there ain't no God in Israel. Because if you if you looking for an answer. Shouldn't you go talk to your God? Good job, Sister Pamela. She called it out. She said, Ahab. Mm. That's what I'm talking about. Right? You should go to your most you should go to the most high God. And now he's saying, listen, y'all trying to go to these familiar spirits, which people are still doing today. What do you think it means when, when a person say, you know, well, you know. My my great grandma, you know, she always my grandma, she always guided me. My brother, he always guided me, but I know he looking we lost him. He passed now, but he looking down on us. That feel good, don't it? Ain't true. Oh, you know, he was in my dream last night and he was talking to me. He's telling me, Oh, really? That's where you're getting your answers from? A dream of your dead brother or your dead grandma? You can't do that. That's a familiar spirit that you're talking to. I didn't have dreams of dead people. Guess what I did? I didn't get no guidance from that thing. Like, yeah, no, nah, that was a cool little dream. You know what I'm saying? But uh, that's about it. We ain't getting no guidance from it. That's how I do. That's how the devil attack us. We got affinity for something. He'll give us a little vision of it. Make it feel like, you know what I'm saying? Make it feel like something special is happening. Right? When in reality, that's just a temptation to go, go the wrong way. We have to guard ourselves. We don't even understand how, how constant the attacks are from Satan. A lot of stuff we just be looking at it like it's innocent, like it's not a big deal. Like, oh, you just being too strict, brother. Oh, you just doing that. I know, I get it. I understand. I'm letting you know all this stuff is an attack. You got to be strict by the book if you want to be as safe as you can possibly be. All right? Keep going. Should not a people seek unto their God for mm -hmm. the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony? If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Mm -hmm. And they shall pass through it, hardly bested and hungry. And it shall so you understand... Past. What we talking about? We are talking about last, last, uh, last uh, uh, fellowship hour. We are kind of talking about how, like, with everybody saying all these different things, right? You got this camp saying they camp of ICU PPE, right? And then you got this other camp that's talking about they, you know, what I'm saying Israel or Christ, and you got another camp that's that's. Uh, Church of Christ. And you got another, you know what I'm saying? That ain't a camp. That's a church, right? And then you got this other church and this other denomination. Everybody, all these different people, and everybody say they right. Everybody fully convinced about what they teach. Everybody know the book. Everybody, you know what I'm saying, can quote it. Everybody teaching. Everybody got a Bible study. Everybody got a congregation. Some of them got a lot of money. Some of them don't. So it's like, how do we know what's real and what's not real? And we talked about, you know what I'm saying, that, you know what I'm saying, by obeying the will of the Father. That he'll reveal to us what's true and what's not, right? But another thing that we look at is what we just read, right? Read it again. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because that it, there is no light in them. We have to line it up with the word specifically, not just like, oh, okay, well, this person said that. You know what I'm saying? He said that, you know, you might have a pastor that's like preaching at a funeral. He might say, you know, 
it is okay because little Jojo is looking on us from heaven now. He's in a better place now, right? But then you got to go and look into the book. You got to ask Pastor, be like, look, Pastor, I know you said Jojo is looking down. And that feel good, Pastor. It really do. That mean like, that make me, that brings me comfort. But can you show me where the Bible say that? And you know, slick passage, he going to be ready for that. We going to be like, oh, well, let me take you to Philippians. And he's going to say, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I forgot all about that one. He's going to hit you with it quick, too. He's going to be so ready for that. You ain't never seen a pastor so ready. Right? But then you're going to go back and you're going to read it. And when you read it, it's not going to be exactly what he just said. Instead, you're going to see that Paul said, I'd rather be absent to the body, from the body, from the body, and be present with the Lord. Paul didn't tell us to be absent to the body equals present with the Lord. That's not what he said. Paul said, I'd prefer to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Right? So when you hear people say stuff, you have to make sure that the book is saying exactly what they're saying. Because they take and they twist things and interpret things however they see fit. But that's not appropriate for us. You read what Paul's saying, it ain't got nothing to do with somebody looking over you. After, in fact, that same Paul tells us very clearly, comfort you. When somebody die, comfort yourself with this, that they will be resurrected. Now, if you already with the father, why you got to be resurrected? What's more comforting? Somebody is dead in the ground and one day going to be resurrected or they already with God and they looking down on me and giving me guidance right now. If I have my choice, I'm taking the one that's looking over me and looking over me. Not the one that's dead and going to be woken up at the same time. I'm going to be woken up. You can't help me. if You darn dead, too. That don't make no sense. But the one that's looking over, got the binoculars from heaven. Like, yo, 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 no, make a right turn. I can use him. You know what I'm saying? Like, good looking. <laughs> if that was real, that would be preferable, which is why it's preferable when you're sitting down. If I go up in a funeral right now, they better not ever let me do a funeral. If I go up in a funeral right now and I tell, listen, oh, no, it's but dead. Now, I ain't really know his life like that. But perhaps. If he was righteous, we'll see him resurrected at the end of days. How that's going to make people feel? They're going to be looking like, well, resurrected at the end of the day. You know what I'm saying? We got to wait until the end of the day. That same thing for all of us. And um, we all got to be righteous for that to happen. Jeez, there's a whole lot of ifs. That ain't that comforting. But when you say, listen, somebody dead, they looking on for heaven. That's, man, that's some comfort there. It's a lie, but it's comfort. Right? It's important. So you got to make sure to know it's true to the law and to the testimony. In other words, to the law and to all the other books of the Bible. If they don't line up with the law and the testimony, specifically, word by word, what you saying? Okay, is that what this is saying? Okay, it's saying it. You check out. Or... Nah, brother, that's not what that's saying. You got to show me more. Now, I admit, sometimes you got to put a couple verses together to paint a picture. You got to be like, hey, okay, well, this verse says this. So, brother, if that's true, how can this be true? If the way you interpret that, how can this? And you put it all together and the brother see, okay, this verse is telling me it can't be that. This verse is telling me it can't be that. This verse is telling me this. Well, all three of them together, I have an understanding. Right? Sometimes you got to do that. Sometimes it's not as simple as just one verse. Right? Nevertheless, it got to be saying exactly what you teach it. You can't just be running out there saying, oh, thus says the Lord, and that, and ain't, that ain't what's said. Right? That's how we understand what the truth is. Is that saying not of the flesh? You got to explain that to me, Sister Pamela. I'm not sure what you mean by that. All right? Keep going. They show oh, I see what you said. No, it's. Is Paul saying he'd rather not be in the flesh? He's saying specifically, Paul is talking about dying, right? So 
Paul is saying, listen, I want, I prefer to be dead and be in the presence of Yahuwah. Right? But Paul understands the prophecy. Paul knows that if he dies a righteous man, he'll be resurrected and beware. In the presence of Yahuwah. Mm -hmm. He knows that that's the prophecy. So he's saying, listen, I prefer if you if it was up to me, I'd fast forward this thing. And that that's another point. We sit here as Christians. We sit here and we thank God that we alive. Meanwhile, the righteous examples that we have from the book is looking forward to being dead. Because you know it's so much better ahead of you. When you really believe that, then you look at this stuff like, man, I don't care nothing about this life. It's just a means to get through it. Especially when you ain't got the attachments to this life. It's just a means to get through it. But we so attached to everything in this life. And we value what's going on in this life more than our belief in what's to come. And that's the part that has to change. Because as that changes... Our decisions will change. The more we believe, the more we understand, the more we accept what is to come, the more our decisions change. We're not so weighed down with, with the decisions of this world. We're trying to please our flesh. We're trying to please the people around us. Our decision making is more so what's coming next. What is Yahuwah going to do for me? I hope that answers the question. Sister Pamela, if not, you know what I'm saying? We can address it at the end. Keep going. Let's try to they, get through this. And they shall pass through it hardly, hardly best be stead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness and ang of anguish. And they shall be driven to darkness. Mm -hmm. That's the end of the chapter? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to pick it back up next week at chapter nine. Right. Chapter nine. Read the beginning of chapter nine for me. I'm trying to remember it. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be as such as it were in the vexation. Mm -hmm. At the first, he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali and afterward did more grievously affect her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people mm -hmm. that walked in darkness seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shone. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee, before thee, according to the joy and harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be vain, uh, this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the governor shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting mm. Father, the Prince of Peace. All right. So let's, we go ahead, we go ahead, we go ahead, keep going. We just gonna finish out nine, right? So the beginning of nine is kind of talking to us about the northern kingdoms, the, the furthest north kingdoms, right? So it's talking about Naphtali, and it's talking about, uh oh, that's for a warning. Huh? furthest north tribes what i say kingdom. yeah tri the tribes the tribes of the kingdom that is for, for the furthest north right so uh you have naphtali who, who was the other one naphtali, zebulun zebulun yeah, right so you have naphtali and galilee. zebulun right galilee. which is two of uh, huh i was saying galilee is a city though it's not a tribe but right galilee is another city that's in the north right so it's talking about how those are going to be the first ones that are, are being attacked because people are walking in darkness. Right. And then he gave us a little a little prophecy about the Messiah there, too. But we could talk about that at another time. Then he goes on to talk about how how it's going to be. He compares it to Midian in the time where Midian was our judge and uh, and about how tumultuous tumultuous war is. But then let's back up a little bit where he talks about what is to come. I love this thing. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty right? God. Right, so he said, 
add on to us a child is born. A son is what? A son is given. A son is given. Right? That means we are talking about a man. Right? Then the next thing he says is what? Wonderful counselor. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The Wonderful God. Counselor. The Mighty God. The Mighty God. The Everlasting right? Father. Huh? The Everlasting Father. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. And the Prince of Peace. It's a lot of people that struggle with this idea, right? What I'm about to say, especially other, other Hebrews, right? A lot of us struggle with it because it feels too much like Christianity to us, right? Yahushua is God. That's just something that you did. I mean, look, the Christians ain't wrong about everything. You know what I'm saying? The Christians get it right sometimes. Listen, they are right when they say Jesus is God. When they say that, talking about Yahushua. They right. There's no way around it. There's no way to look at the book and try to make sense of it any other way. Right? Because the book clearly tells you there will be a child born and it says the government will be on the show. In other words, he's going to run the show. And he's going to have a couple names. Two of those names are going to be Mighty God an everlasting father. You make sense of that however you try. But it ain't no way to make sense of that coming from Yahuwah, who is the everlasting father, to say that about a child being born into this world. Unless that child is Yahuwah. Right? You have to deal with that. When these people come to telling you, they listen, there's some people on Twitter, they funny too. It's, it's, it's one guy on Facebook. He's funny because he don't he don't he don't mess with that that you know what I'm saying Yahushua is God stuff. Matter of fact, I don't think he messed with Yahushua at all. So he posts sometimes. He'd be like, he be making fun. He be saying, he be saying, uh, you let y'all Christians tell it. You know what I'm saying? Jesus is praying to himself, like Jesus. I mean, he's a, he, he he's like Jesus says, God, <laughs> please bless me by my own self by my own arm and save me from what I'm doing to myself so I can save myself. But thank you for saving me. You know what I'm saying? And like, he'll put like a, this confusing context of God and Jesus talking to themselves as they are themselves. And I'm like, yeah, pretty much. You know what I'm saying? I know I get it, but yeah, you pretty spot on. He think it's funny. And it is funny the way he put it, but it's like, I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds wild, but you deal with it however you may, because that's exactly what this is saying. Otherwise, you got to deal with some human being being called everlasting father. What can be everlasting except for God? Right? How do you have God saying there's no God beside me, yet he's telling us, he's sending us someone who will be called mighty God? These are things that Everybody got to deal with this book, this scripture. You don't like it. That's why I always tell these people, if you don't mess with the Messiah, if you believe the scripture and you don't believe the Messiah, you got to throw the whole book away. You got to throw the whole book away. Right? There's no way to believe. You making a fool out of yourself. Next thing you got to do is you'd be like, no, somebody added, a Christian added that in there. That's your best bet. Right? Keep going. To clear up uh, Sister Pamela's question, she was asking that uh, 65 years after the sign, Yahushua came, Ephraim was to be broken. Has that prophecy been fulfilled? So God was saying in 65 years, Assyria is going to take over Israel and they mm -hmm. will be carried captive into Assyria. And right. God told Ahaz, I'm going to give you a sign. A virgin is going to give birth to um, give birth to a child and basically saying, you know, he's going to be the one, right? So he's letting them know, like, this is the sign that you know that these things are going to take place, right? Ahaz, of course, is not going to live that long to see the Messiah come out. So a lot of times it would be like a double prophecy and God will put two time periods in one verse. 
So he's letting them know, okay, in 65 years, Assyria is taking over Israel. But the sign I'm gonna give you a virgin gonna be a virgin gonna give birth to a child. Now Ahaz ain't gonna be allowed to see that, but at the same time, when God told Abraham, I'm gonna get this land to your to your descendants forever, right? Now, a Abraham didn't see that either, right? Matter of fact, it still hasn't happened yet. He gave it to him for a short period of time and kicked him out. But the fact to say, I'm going to tell Abraham, I'm going to get his land to your descendants forever, that still needs to happen because the Messiah is going to come back and establish that. And the Messiah is a seed of Abraham. So when you look in that prophecy, he's not saying that um, Israel is going to be taken in 65 years. And then after that, the Messiah is going to be born. No, he's saying Israel is going to be taken in 65 years. But I'm going to give you a sign to let you know that that uh, what I say is true. All right. So the 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 tricky part with this is you have to remember Ahaz didn't ask for a sign. Right. The most I got told Ahaz to ask for a sign. Right. You remember Gideon asked for a sign. And when Gideon asked for a sign. He's like, uh, you know what I'm saying? He's like, you know what I'm saying? Give me a sign. The most high God gave him the fleece that was on the uh, on the grass and the dew. And he did it both ways. Do on the fleece and not on the grass and do on the grass, not on the fleece. Right. And that was the sign that for Gideon. But Ahaz didn't. He he told Ahaz to ask for a sign. And I'd like to believe that the most high God would have did something similar for, for Ahaz had he asked for one. But Ahaz didn't ask for a sign. And he told him, you wary me. So he said, I'm going to give you a sign. The sign that he gave Ahaz is about the destruction of Judah. So remember, the reason, the, the message that he was given to Ahaz is that Judah is not going to be destroyed. Not by, uh, not by reason and not by Pekah. They teaming up against you, but they're not going to do it. Don't be scared. It's not going to happen. He knows that that's far-fetched and that this is a scary situation. Let me give you a sign. Tell me what you want to see, right? Then Ahaz like, nah, I don't want to tempt the Lord. I ain't going to ask for a sign. So the most high God is saying, oh, now you're giving me a hard time. Okay, I'm going to give you a sign now e anyway. And so he gave him a sign that's far in the future about the destruction of, uh, the destruction of Judah, right? Which is going to be the next thing that, that's happening. So and look at it more as like that was God taking a jab at him. Like, oh, okay, you messed up, right? I gave you an opportunity to, to strengthen your faith. Now I'm going to give you a sign. So the sign that the Most High God gave him was not about the, the, the invasion that was, uh, that's going to come that we're we going to read about next week. It's not about that. The sign he gave him goes further in the future about how rebellious Judah is going to be taken off the map. Does that make sense? If not, we can we can talk about it a little more tomorrow. Keep going. Let's try to finish out nine. The Lord sent a word unto Jacob. Wait, sorry. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David. Mm -hmm. And upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Lord sent a word unto Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel. And mm -hmm. the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria. And they shall that, that say in the pride of the stoutness of heart, the bricks are falling down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will build them into cedars. Right. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of reason against him and join his enemies together. Right. So... The most high God is speaking about how how rebellious our people are. It's the same concept that we were just talking about when the word most high God is like putting stuff against you to to kind of bring you to attention. <laughs> Excuse me. The most high God is putting stuff against you. He's he tearing your life apart to try to get you to focus on him. He's taking away all the stuff that your, your heart is, is is drawn to to try to get you closer to him. But we look at it as. We will rebuild this. We'll make it stronger next time. So we doubling down in our sin and in our distractions. Right? Keep going. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of reason against him and join his enemies together. The Syrians mm -hmm. before and the Philistines behind. And they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand mm -hmm. is stretched out still. 
Mm -hmm. People turn not unto him that smite them, neither do they seek Yahuwah of hosts. Therefore, the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and mm -hmm. branch one day. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to error, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Therefore, the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For everyone is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For mm -hmm. when it burns as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and shall kindle the thickness of the forest, and shall mount up like lifting up of smoke. Though the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land of is the land darkened. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother and shall snatch out the right hand and be hungry and shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man his flesh of his own arm. Messiah, Ephraim, and Messiah, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh, and they together shall be against Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And let me tell you, when that hand is stretched out, it ain't got nothing to do with trying to get a handshake, trying to get a hug. No, 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 no. That's whooping time. You know what I'm saying? He getting some butt. When his hand, when guy hand is stretched out, he ain't trying to tell you, come here. He whooping some butt, right? Keep going. That was the end of the chapter. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to stop there. Chapter 10, I definitely want to get to chapter 10. But before we get to chapter 10, we got to go back and read about Ahaz and this invasion. Because everything up to this point is kind of, not everything, but a lot of what we dealt with up to this point has talked about this this conspiracy that Ahaz and the king of uh, Damascus are not Ahaz. Um, uh, the king of Damascus and Pekah have conspired together, their confederate, to join together and take out Ahaz and Judah, right? So we need to kind of read how that plays out, and then we'll come back and we'll start to read uh, chapter 10 and a few other chapters of uh, Isaiah. Any questions? Any questions before we wrap up? I feel like I'm not getting all the chats. I'll be seeing like some of them, but I don't know if I miss some of them. I saw somebody say something about Sister Sharon, but I don't see Sister Sharon. Yeah, she was on early. She's been quiet today, but she was on in the beginning. Oh, okay, yeah, I do see her all the way at the top. Okay. All right, yeah, I no think questions. I missed a few. Okay. All right. Well, let's pray out. I appreciate y'all. Uh, fellowship fellowship hour is going to be at 4 p.m. Um, if questions do come up, bring them there. We can talk about them all together, get a little deeper and a little, uh, a little more specific, kind of break down any, any verses or chapters that we need to. Um, or just, you know, sit and chat and make jokes like we usually do. You know what I'm saying? However we do it. Um, but that's all we got today. Let's, uh, let's pray out. Sabbath peace. Sabbath peace.